Unit 1, Chapter 13, The Expansion of American Industry, 1850-1900, Section 1, A Technological Revolution. <clears throat> In the years after the Civil War, new technology revolutionized American life. This chapter and this section specifically are basically setting the foundation for everything else that we're going to be studying in the late 1800s, the whole 20th century, and the beginning part of the 21st century. The inventions and the frameworks for business, the regulation by government, and the system of protecting American ingenuity basically give way to the lifestyle that we have today. The second industrial age, and as well as the um, communication revolution, was basically rung in by the first communication sent via telegraph, <clears throat> courtesy of Samuel F. B. Morse. You can see what the first message was of the telegraph, courtesy of Miss Annie Hel Ellsworth, which went from Washington to Baltimore on May 24th of 1844. Now in class you were divided into three different groups. This is for anyone that was not in group A that is looking for extended information on this chapter in this section. Before you can understand what was truly happening and the weight of the changes that happened in the 1860s, you need to understand what life was like before 1865. So life during the 1860s and prior to that, as you probably know, there was no indoor electric lighting. Your daily rituals were dictated by the sunlight. If you could afford them, you could have candles and oil lamps, but if you didn't, instead of sitting in the dark, you simply went to bed, and then you awoke at first daylight. Um, ice was available at great costs, but this was not the case for the most part. And even if you could chisel out the ice from a nearby stream or lake, you still had to make sure that you used it efficiently so that you could keep your food from spoiling. Other methods included salting and smoking meat. Uh, another aspect of life in the past was the lack of communication, mainly because the mail took at least 10 days to um, to go from the Midwest to one of the coasts, and vice versa, three weeks to travel from coast to coast, and if you were waiting for news from Europe, it could take months. Now, this lack of electricity not only dictates daily life, it also dictated the slow production in businesses. Um, the lack of refrigeration basically meant that most of your daily life was spent consuming, collecting, and preserving food. And the lack of communication as far as mail goes made people hesitant to move into the Midwest and sometimes to even migrate to America in the first place from Europe because people were afraid of leaving their families and maybe not being able to be near them in case of an emergency. In the late 1800s, the amount of invent inventions not only in physical inventions, but in processes, changed life so drastically that you could physically see it in the change in the number of patents, which are licenses that gave an inventor the exclusive right to make, use, or sell an invention. From 1790 to 1860, about 36,000 patents were issued. It's specifically in Article 1, Section 8, um, that Congress has the explicit power of issuing copyrights and patents because our founding fathers knew that in order for innovations to actually happen in American society, inventors needed to know that their, their ideas were protected and that they weren't going to be stolen. Because nobody's going to put that much time and effort into an invention or into an idea if they know it can be stolen by somebody else. From 1860 to 1890, which is just a 30 year difference, there were about 500,000 patents that were issued. Some of these included for the typewriter, the telephone, and the phonograph. Investment in new inventions basically meant was a way for these men to get their, their money and their funding. Um, they received financial backing for their American ingenuity. And this, this idea of financial backing and loaning and investing created new industries and expanded old ones. 
By 1900, America enjoyed the highest standard of living due to industrial productivity. Power stations across the country ended up popping up outside of cities <clears throat> as electricity was developed and new forms of energy. Um, this affected daily life and it also affected business life. Some of the new forms of energy that were developed, specifically Edwin L. Drake is attributed with using steam power for the purpose of drilling for oil in Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859. Many investors were very hesitant about investing in him and using steam-powered energy, but uh, he was successful and the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company grew and his system of steam-powered drilling for oil ended up becoming a major industry and mass-produced oil to the point where it could be used extensively across the country and for businesses. Oil was sent to oil refineries, turned into crude oil. Um, turning the crude oil to kerosene, and kerosene was basically used for in-home lamps. Um, ironically, gasoline was a byproduct from this crude oil, from this oil refinery process, and uh, for a time being was just dumped and discarded as a waste product until automobiles came into the picture in the 1880s. You also have Thomas Edison, whose name you're probably very familiar with, an inventor from New Jersey who experimented with electric light. He developed direct currents, which unfortunately were very expensive and uh, only traveled a mile or two. In 1876, um, from money paid due to his improvements to stock market tickers, he was able, at the age of 23, to create his invention factory in Menlo Park, New Jersey. He had no formal science training, but through basic trial and error and tinkering, he found that he could create affordable in-home lamps from an inexpensive material that would glow um, without burning out quickly. He realized in 1880 that this fiber was uh, basically a bamboo fiber. Um, his idea was expanded upon by Louis Latimer, who worked in his lab and found an improved method for producing the filament in light bulbs. Then George Westinghouse further built upon that idea with alternative currents, AC, um, and as after George Westinghouse developed this in 1885, electricity became cheaper, it could be transported to through longer distances through the use of transformers which increased and decreased power levels eventually we see general electric popping up and westinghouse electric now electricity had the ability to make the daily lives of people much easier um, in 1889 the sewing machine which used to be pumped by foot was able to be utilized using steam power and electric power, uh, increasing and expanding the textile industry to make ready-made clothing so people did not have to spend their daily lives producing their own clothes for themselves. The cost of production also ended up decreasing because of the use of electricity in factories. Thousands of jobs open. The refrigerator in the daily home decreased food spoilage and took away the need to undertake time-consuming preservation methods. Um, however, it was slightly unbalanced because electricity did not go to the rural areas and the appliances were very expensive. So it's going to take a while for this to become an equal luxury for all the different areas of the country and the upper, middle, and lower class. Communication was also expanded on, as we said, because of the telegraph. The idea started really in the early 1700s. Some developed before um, Samuel Morse's patent. So in reality, Samuel Morse did not invent it, but he perfected it. Um, he started the Western Union Telegraph Company after the Civil War. In, by 1870, there was 100,000 miles of wire with 9 million messages transmitted by 1900. 
there were 900,000 miles of wire and 63 million messages were being transmitted per year. Later, this gave way to the telephone, first called the talking telegraph, um, patented by Alexander Graham Bell, who was an immigrant from Scotland. He received this patent on March 7, 1876, only at the age of 29 years. In 1885, he set up the American Telephone and Telegraph Company that installed central switchboards and linked cities together. In 1879, Rutherford B. Hayes was the first president to install a telephone in the White House. Now, the railroad system was finally completed on May 10th in 1869. The Transcontinental Railroad not only connected the country physically, but it also connected it as far as communication goes. Uh, Steam-powered ships were good, but they could not go cross-country. Trains, um, there were problems with them, however, before the Transcontinental Railroad. Trains only would run on certain tracks depending on what privatized corporation they were owned by. So some of the trains could not travel on different tracks. They were owned by different companies. You have to remember they were in competition together. There were no standard guidelines. There were constantly delays. The schedules didn't match up between the trains that were run by these different private countries or uh, companies. So the government funded the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, it utilized two private companies to do this, the Central Pacific Railroad and the Union Pacific Railroad. There was a big debate on whether or not the government should be involved, but it ended up paying these companies and these men who own these companies through government land, and it was completed in 1869. The last golden uh, spike was hammered in at Promont Promontory Summit, Utah. The Central Pacific President, Leland Stanford, hammered this final golden spike in. Uh, improvements that were made later on with the rail line included steel rails, replacing the iron ones. Uh, air brakes were installed, courtesy of Mr. Westinghouse, who thought of that idea in 1869. And they created track gauges and signals and on-train communication used by the telegraph um, for reducing collisions. They also came up with time zones so that there was faster transport of goods. Um, lower production costs overall, the creation of national markets, because now you can distribute to anywhere in the country, um, and it became a model for big businesses. The, the railroad system basically for the transcontinental railroad needed to have professional managers and specialized departments so that it would run efficiently from coast to coast. Big businesses saw this, so they decided that it was in their best interest to also have professional managers to, to run their companies and their factories, but to have um, experts in each different area of their business so that they were specialized by department so that it was kind of like a bureaucracy. One person didn't have to be an expert in everything. It was departmentalized. This also stimulated other industries to expand, including the steel industry. In the steel industry, basically, you see a large expansion from the Bessemer process as well. Henry Bessemer was uh, from England, and at the same time that he was developing the Bessemer process, ironically, a man named William Kelly was also developing this process in Kentucky. In 1856, he received a patent, and basically it's a way of adding carbon. Um, well, beforehand, they, they melted iron and added carbon to remove the impurities. But the Bessemer process basically found a better way to remove the impurities and extract the, the steel on a larger scale. Um, this ended up not only being utilized in the railroad system, but also for high-rise buildings in our major cities, which was essential because of the mass influx of immigrants, newly freed slaves, and other persons looking for jobs in these urban areas. Um, they needed a place to live. And also, the finishing of the Brooklyn Bridge was a symbol of this American ingenuity, this new engineering, and this advancement in connecting the country through steel.